Are we going to have a recession? Is inflation going to infinity? Stagflation? There's so many voices out there saying so many things, but how do you figure out the good takes from the bad? What happens if everybody's wrong? Here's my take. I think that economic growth is going to fall sharply at the second half of the year, sharper than people expect. And maybe that changes the equation for the Fed. I think inflation is going to ease off quite sharply too. But I've been in markets long enough to know that we all get it completely wrong sometimes, and I could be dead wrong. That's the power of Real Vision. It's that we host the amazing conversations with some of the world's greatest analysts and investors so that our members have the information analysis to inform their own thinking. Over the last weeks, we've published some incredible conversations about what's ahead and how to invest against it. In this video, we've distilled several of them to their key takeaways to get you up to speed quickly. There's a lot going on. <laughs> so I just wanted to pick your brains, see how you're seeing the world. So give us your big picture view, and then we'll start digging into some stuff as we start chatting. So I think kind of like how COVID-19 accelerated a lot of trends that were probably already going to be in place anyway, I think the, the recent military conflicts we're seeing are kind of accelerating some of the problems that were already mounting. And so, for example, we already saw Europe have some energy issues even before any of this conflict broke out, and some of that was now accelerated. I think same thing for food insecurity and things like that. And essentially, I think what we're seeing is a slow kind of unwind of the – the global monetary order that's been around for the past 50 years or so and moving towards a more bifurcated world where we have maybe a little bit more decentralized payment channels, uh, maybe more decentralized choices of storing value, as well as supply chains themselves becoming more bifurcated because we're seeing you know, food protectionism, commodity protectionism. Uh, kind of, uh, you know, commodity, uh, uh, different sort of trade happening around these more like alliances rather than in a global market. Do you think that, I mean, I, I completely share your view on that. What I'm trying to figure out is whether this is creating a step change in inflation, i.e. The, the, the trend of the last 30, 40 years is gone, or whether dem demographics, technology still kind of trump out in the end, and this is a temporary structural shift we're seeing, which is generating this. So I think, I mean, most inflation is transitory, but but transitory can last for years in inflation's case, right? So, I mean, the 70s were transitory, but it was, you know, it, it was long enough that, you know, uh, it, it wasn't really transitory in terms of a, a trading perspective, an investment perspective, a lifestyle perspective. And so my base case for a while has been that tw the 2020s would be more inflationary than the 2010s. Um, the, you know, the exact height that we were going to reach depends on these variables that are hard to predict ahead of time, like whether or not there'll be war, whether or not there'll be factors like that. And so I think now we're at risk of hitting some of the higher levels of that of that kind of range, that probability range that I think was going to play out anyway. And now we're kind of on the higher side. So I, I would characterize this kind of like the 70s or the 40s in the sense that we are going to probably have a pretty persistent amount of inflation. But even that, it won't be a straight line. If you looked at the 40s, you had price controls at some point. 70s, you had you know price controls, you had wage controls. There basically there are periods where even in an inflationary decade, you can have disinflationary periods, right? So you, you get these waves of inflation. And I think the 2020s will be no different, where you could get, for example, a de-escalation of some of the, the big trends we're seeing now. Things can be overdone, traders can pile in, things get to consensus, uh, and then there's some sort of kind of unwind of that. And then you can have another spike up. We've already seen this happen in, in European natural gas, for example. There are periods where it got overdone, came back down, and then got even more overdone. And I think you could have the same thing on a kind of a longer trend line. So so I do think that if you look over the past 25 years or so, you know, historically, money supply and CPI, if you use, say, five-year rolling periods rather than the noisy kind of year-over-year -year period, there generally is pretty strong correlation. But there are periods where you can have a pretty significant disconnect, and that's usually due to some rapid technological change. We've, we've unlocked some new abundance that allows for, uh, you know, less inflation than you'd expect from the money supply growth. And so that, that happened, for example, in the late uh, 1800s. You know, you had the invention of, of the internal combustion engine, you had electrification, you had the discovery of oil, the uh, United States had nearly unlimited land, uh, and so th that was abundance. And you kind of had a similar thing over the past 25 years where we unlocked so much global labor uh, and, and, you know, co corporations were able to do a lot of geographic arbitrage that you've had a disconnect between, you know, say money supply growth and wages domestically uh, in many countries. And so I think that, that that particular force is probably coming to an end, at least for a period of time, uh, because I think we've, we've kind of squeezed a lot of juice out of the globalization orange. 
and that now we're you know we might have hit kind of peak globalization meaning that we don't we don't unwind globalization necessarily but we could stop accelerating globalization and all else being equal that should be more inflationary one of the things i'm thinking of is i've been looking at thinking that the 1940s is probably the most similar period less so the 70s you know it's the post war it's kind of the same kind of structure we've got now gdp was volatile Inflation at first took off and then kind of eased over time once, you know, we started to see manufacturing pick up and, and all of that. We saw yield curve control. We saw um, um, a lot of fiscal stimulus. What period do you think we're most similar to? So I do think the 40s are the, are the single most close period uh, to what we have now. And that's because – so if you look – you know, and this this whole debate over the past two years that, that people had about inflation versus disinflation, what is money creation, where does inflation come from? So what made the 40s different than the 70s is the 70s, it was very bank lending driven inflation. Right, you had the demographics boom. The boomers were kind of entering the home buying years, uh, and that was that was around the world. And so you had a big expansion of of money supply led by commercial bank lending. And then on top of that, you added fuel to the fire with with deficits around you know guns and butter program, Vietnam War, things like that. But it was really a bank lending driven type of inflation, whereas the 40s were totally the opposite, where banks weren't doing a lot of lending and it was it was that monetization of very large fiscal deficits the wartime finance kind of a command and control economy and also in the 70s you had super low debt levels at least public debt and, and pretty low private debt levels so they could raise rates dramatically to try to you know cause a mild recession kind of contain inflation without causing widespread insolvency Whereas in the 40s, when you had sovereign debt levels very high due to the war, you couldn't realistically raise rates to double digits. And so instead, they, they held rates low. They did yield curve control. And so that, that decade, the 1940s, if you go from, say, the early 40s to the early 50s, when you had that kind of final inflation spike, you had about 6% average annual inflation, but it was very bumpy. You had literally, at one point, technically 19% year-over-year CPI, but then the next year, you'd have like zero or even like mildly deflationary. Then you'd have another spike. Uh, and so I, I kind of characterize this period similar to the the 40s. The the one the one thing that might be similar to the 70s is the energy situation. So what made the 70s also unique, besides the the you know the demographics boom you had, is that U.S. domestic oil production peaked in 1970. So we had this kind of nearly a century long continual expansion more or less, of, of U.S. energy production. That peaked in 1970, and so the U.S. became more reliant on the Middle East at the same time as we were going through that very big demographics boom. And that, that's what fueled inflation because you had that supply. Yeah, you had a supply and demand shock at the same time. Exactly. Whereas now we have less of a demand shock, obviously, but we do have a supply shock. And so I think we have 40-style monetary and fiscal policy combined with you know, a not unlimited – uh, commodities, right? So that that's where we get this more inflationary environment from. So I think the 40s are a similar environment, especially you could say, you know, right now the United States looks like the 1940s UK because back then the United States was running structural trade uh, uh, surplus. We looked more like China in some ways, right? We were the rising power. We were the export place, whereas the UK was more of the established power, the structural trade deficit, uh, and and you know, going through the same sort of wartime financing. James Aitken, he's got 30 years of financial experience and is widely followed by policymakers, investors, hedge funds around the world. He takes the secular inflation view, as does Gerard Minak. Gerard runs Minak Advisors, and he also advises the world's most preeminent hedge funds, family offices and institution. What's interesting about Gerard is he was a secular stagnationist for decades until now. He's changed his view. Yeah, I, I've been a card-carrying secular stagnationist uh, for a long time. Uh, before even Larry Summers popularised the term, I was I was telling people that the world was turning Japanese. Uh, well, I've I've resigned from the club. Um, I, I think the era of secular stagnation is over, and I, I do think the pandemic has been the the catalyst for change. And I, I say catalyst in the in the in the right way to use the word, uh, it's accelerated changes that I could see were going to happen anyway. With fiscal, a change, central banks, higher capex. I think after four decades, where the forces of secular stagnation have been becoming more powerful, uh, we finally see a change in the secular trends. And let me just make it very uh, practical for 
the people who watch this who are more interested in market outcomes than they are in economics. The key financial consequence of secular stagnation was the trend decline in interest rates. We have seen for four decades the cycle in interest rates in the US. Every cycle low has been lower than the prior low. Every cycle high has been lower than the prior high. So unless, yeah, and you weren't doing this, I wasn't doing this, we weren't trading markets in the 70s. Unless a listener was watching markets in the 70s, none of us has seen a cycle where the peak in the 10-year Treasury yield was higher, higher than the prior peak. I think that's coming. I think in this cycle, we get we get the peak uh, surpassing the prior peak, and that's the most concrete outcome of these secular changes. Now, uh, obviously, what's happening in Ukraine um, complicates that, and there are tail risks there that I appreciate. Um, if, if we can put that to one side, which is you know, in a real world sense almost impossible, but pr prior to Ukraine, I was absolutely telling people that we would see interest rates in the US go higher than we have seen uh, for several years. It would be the first time that we've seen a cycle peak exceed the prior cycle peak. It's still my base case, but with a little less conviction because of what's happening in Ukraine. As we came out of the GFC, the market was saying, you know what, uh, the long run real Fed fund rate can be two to two and a half percent positive. And that was what they were also pricing prior to the GFC. So no change. Despite the, the depth of the downturn, we were going to go back to a world where ultimately the, the neutral rate of interest was over 2% real uh, and we would have positive real rates on average through the, through the cycle. It was only when you had the euro crisis and austerity in the US that the, the near-term rate expectations collapsed and people moved to... Uh, assuming lower for longer. But even then, they were expecting that we'd go back to real positive rates in the long run. Last two years, that real long run Fed expectation has turned negative. So we have markets now that are no longer pricing lower for longer, they're pricing lower forever. We never get out of this. We, we always have negative real rates. Uh, once again, it's it's the resilience of the view that nothing has changed. And I just think that's a mistake. I think the world has changed. And that's not to say that we're going to get necessarily higher inflation. It's to say that the interest rate required to have a normal inflation rate is now higher than it was post-GFC. And the peak in rates this cycle is going to be higher than what the market expects and the, the world has changed. Uh, but the market so far, I've got to say, doesn't agree with me. The resilience of the economy in the face of rising rates is, is what I debate with everybody at the moment. And what's absolutely central to my view is that the US, and, and this is um, uh, particularly true on the US, it's, it's, it's not necessarily true elsewhere, but I think the US will be more resilient than markets recognise. I, I think the household sector is in as good a shape as it's been for three decades. Um, it's delevered. I mean, delevered by defaulting, but hey, that's deleveraging after the, after the GFC. Um, so debt to income is is down. It's at around about 100% of income. Uh, the debt service burden is at the lowest level since the mid 60s and um, you know, most household debt in the US is mortgage debt and most mortgage debt is fixed rate. So it takes a long time for Fed rate changes to feed into debt service burdens. Um, there's a lot of saving that's been built up through the pandemic because of unspent stimulus. But most importantly, uh, and it comes back to the, the change in the Fed behaviour and a point I mentioned earlier, which is that wage growth is so strong. Now, um, for the average American, they don't get dividend checks. They don't get interest checks. I mean, no one gets interest checks at the moment, but yeah, in, in normal times, the average American doesn't get interest checks. Their bread and butter is, is wages, is labor costs. 
Now, in the year to December quarter last year, uh, that was up 3% real. So that means the average American getting 3% more. That's with inflation at four decade highs. The nominal increase in aggregate labor income was almost 9%. Now, what I expect is that inflation will fall over the next 12 months. I think that labour income growth will also slow a little, but I think inflation will slow faster. So we're going to end up at the end of this year, I think, with aggregate real labour income running at 3 or 4% real. Now, if that translates into real consumer spending, given that consumer spending is 70% of GDP, that's going to add more to GDP growth than any sensible estimate of what trend GDP is, and interest rates are not going to make a difference. I don't want to come across as a bear um, at the moment. I mean, I think in my worldview, this is going to be a tough period for low yield, no yield assets. Um, now that 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 runs the risk gamut from, on the one hand, ostensibly safe assets. I mean. Who knew bond yields could go positive? You know, there's going to be people that have been in the market a couple of years ago. Gee, I, this is like a Y2K problem. I didn't know that you could have a plus sign in front of the bond yield. Um, to and here I'm going to, um, I'm now I'm going to tread on your toes, Raoul. But anyway, to, to the other end, which is, <laughs> which is crypto, right? So yeah, no yield uh, speculative assets. So yeah, I think the two, the the, the two edges of the risk spectrum are going to be under pressure. But the stuff in the middle can do okay. I mean, history shows that you know your broad-based equity markets they do okay when the Fed's tightening. I mean, what's what's a killer for equity markets is recession, and it's not until markets sniff out recession that they that they suffer. Putin and the pandemic changes everything, um, and I don't think the markets yet work that out. The market is still in a pre-pandemic mindset where, uh, as I said, that I, when I look at my Bloomberg, th there is no debate. Um, the market is saying we remain in a low rate, low growth, low inflation structural situation. And uh, I just think the market is wrong. Um, and it will take time for the market to come around to my view. But I, I think that means that particularly for rates, the cycle peak is going to be higher than what uh, most people expect. Can I get my high horse for a few moments here? Do is it. that okay? Do it, my yeah, friend. Right, right, right. Because everybody tells me the reason we've got expensive equity markets is low rates. Give me a break. That's bullshit. Um, low rates historically have gone hand in hand with equity markets that derate. Low rates do not lift equity valuations. If you look at the long run relationship between interest rates and equity valuations, when rates are falling from high levels, absolutely good for equities. When rates go to very low levels, normally bad for equities. Of course, this is correlation, not causation. The macro conditions that lead to low rates are almost always macro conditions that make it difficult for companies to grow earnings, which is why if you really believe low rates go hand in hand with equity valuations rising, why isn't Japan the most expensive equity market in the world? Why right. isn't or Europe? Europe. The next yeah. That's right. So it's the US is the one market that re-rated in the post-GFC cycle. Why? Well, it wasn't Fed QE. It wasn't low rates. It was that that was the one market that could grow its earnings. It, it was the exceptional market because you had companies that were able to grow earnings in a low growth, low inflation um, cycle. Now, that ability was actually quite quite limited. Um, and it was the sexy six, you know who they are, the fangs. I mean, it's no longer the fangs because Facebook is now meta. But um, you know, the six big companies grew their earnings throughout the last cycle. If you pull them out of the S&P 500 and create an S&P 494, which is what I do, um, that has not really done a lot better than the rest of the world. And just to underscore what a what a what a horrible cycle it's been. If you look at the either trailing or forecast earnings, doesn't matter, for the MSCI 
all country index excluding the US, i.e. the world outside the US, earnings, either forecast or trailing, today are lower than they were at the peak in 08. So we've had global equities outside the US 14 years, zero earnings growth. No wonder markets derated, notwithstanding low rates. The US was absolutely the exception, and it re-rated. Now, the forward-looking point is, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. If you re-rated because rates went down, you'll derate when rates go up. But if you are a market like Japan, I, I can't think of anything more positive for Japanese equities than JGB yields going to 1%. If JGB yields go to 1%, Japanese equities are going to be on a, on a huge bull market because the macro conditions that would push JGB yields to 1% is going to be absolutely beautiful for Japanese corporates. So, boiled down, we're in a world where very few markets re rated in the low yield environment of the post-GFC cycle. If we now enter a world where rates are going up, that's not necessarily bad for risky assets. It's only getting bad for risky assets that have relied on low rates, which is overwhelmingly the US market. By sector, it's, you know, it's tech, it's, it's long duration stuff. There's a lot of markets that if you saw yields go up, would actually re-rate. And once again, that's correlation, not causation. It's, markets aren't re-rating because yields go up. Markets are re-rating because growth is coming back. And both markets, fixed income and equities, are responding to that changed growth outlook. Um, so for me, this is not necessarily a bearish world, but it's absolutely a world where uh, leadership changes, where uh, we had a decade where the ability to grow earnings was really scarce and therefore if you had that scarce ability you got re-rated um, but if it becomes less scarce uh, everybody can grow earnings in a strong cycle um, investors are going to look to maximize the the cyclical bang for the buck and, and look for companies that have got operational leverage and move to more secular uh, sorry cyclical uh, stocks and sectors so we see this leadership change and as I said, the low yield, no yield assets um, get get left behind in my view. We're trying to find any kind of pattern that we can rely upon to help us navigate this period. You know, there's shades obviously of the 1970s, Yom Kippur, OPEC price shock. There's a lot of shades of the 1970s. There's, you know, if you want to be dramatic, Volcker in the Fed fighting inflation, shades of 1994. You can go back if you want to be dramatic to the 60s, guns or butter or guns and butter. You can talk about 56 in Hungary, but there's not there's not a great deal of uh, historical analogues that can help us navigate the present. So we're going to have to use our imaginations. And I think that's the important thing because there's a lot happening that has not happened before, certainly not in the past 20 odd years. So I'm trying to take as much time out from all of this as I can just to read and think. And again, not too many great uh, historical analogues for this situation, but I think it's fair to say there's an acceleration at a minimum, an acceleration of some pretty powerful trends that were already well underway. And um, I'd be happy to go into some of those if you wish. Same, right? You're, we're all grasping and trying to get some understanding. And I looked at 73, 74, and that was a you know, the economy died pretty quick, inflation came off pretty quick, and then obviously things came after it. I've also looked at the 1940s, which I've been using as closer to my base case, where we got post-World War II, we saw this supply shock because there was no supply, inflation went up, it came down again, and we had this period of yield curve control plus growth plus, you know, it was actually a good a good period. 70s, 73, 74 was obviously a nasty recession. Um, and then kind of after that, things did okay. 
94 is similar as well because rates have moved so fast, so fast, and the yield curve almost inverted then, and it was a false one. So, yeah, it's it's a struggle. So what do you think are the big things that we need to look at? And, and where are you – I mean, again, you've just told me you're not using the historics, but you're – more structured towards the secular inflation side, I guess. I am, mate, yes. And I'll, and I'll tell you why. It's like, it, it, just a brief recap, I was never convinced that inflation was going to be transitory, although how to calibrate non-transitory inflation, I mean, it's quite difficult. But it was just a best guess that it was likely to persist for a number of reasons. And now we've had this event which reminds us of the world we're exiting. So you think about the past, let's say, three, four decades in finance and, and the way the world works. It's all about optimize, optimize, optimize. Everything's done on a just-in-time basis in order to maximize profits. In other words, globalization. And that's fine. We understand the way the game is played. But you get to a stage where everything is over-optimized and a system in so many ways that's reliant on everything being just in time, I think out of necessity is evolving to just in case. And that implies not only to global supply chains, particularly as we're seeing global food and medical supply chains, but also the way we may wish to think about our portfolios in general. And, and to be clear, it's hard. It's really hard to unlearn things and transition to a different world but we are exiting this world of everything being optimized and I think moving to more of a just-in-case model. And the Ukraine situation has, I think, served to accelerate that. I mean, it's interesting, Raoul, that the very day that Putin went into Ukraine, the Biden administration released a supply chain update, or should I say supply chain resilience update, February 24th. Um, co-authored by seven different U.S. government agencies. And to paraphrase a little bit, it was all about national resilience and securing supply chains. Good. That's what we should have been thinking about for decades. But again, everything was about globalization. And I think we're moving from a world, how about this for a metaphor for all of us in finance? KYC, know your client, as the bedrock of finance and the bedrock of banking, or at least it should be. I think we're moving into a world that you might call KYS, which is know your supplier. And the burden will be put on anyone running their supply chains through all corners of this world, which everyone does, to say, all right, prove to us that you are not doing business in some way with someone on the naughty step or someone like Mr. Putin or parts of China or using Uyghur slave labor. And I think it's long overdue. So KYC, we take that for granted. KYS, know your supplier, I think is going to come, become increasingly important under the label of national resilience. And I think the United States is right at the front of that. But again, Raoul, I think people have missed how important and how focused the Biden administration is on national resilience and supply chain resilience in particular. And whilst they won't talk of it explicitly, there seems to have been an implicit trade-off, and I think the right one, that like, look, we can complain about inflation, which they are, but the priority has to be national resilience and supply chain resilience. And if that at the margin underwrites or in some sectors exacerbates some of the inflation pressures we are seeing, so be it. And then... On top of this, we have an accelerated renewables transition, okay? With the extraordinary exception of, say, a Soros or a Druckenmiller, who didn't just admit they were wrong, but turn their positions around 180 degrees, it's, it's very hard for any of us to say, I believe X, I'm going to pivot, not just stop myself out of a view, but I'm going to go 180 degrees the other way. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. So what's that got to do with the climate transition and renewables? Well, the politicians, as we've all seen, have invested a tremendous amount of political capital in the climate transition. So in the face of an energy supply shock from Mr. Putin, et cetera, and, and other things, they're not going to chuck it away. You know, they're not going to walk away from 
the climate transition. And you're seeing it everywhere. They're going to double down. But boy, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be so expensive. So if they want to do it, great. But good luck to all those people who want to secure their stockpiles of lithium or cobalt or manganese or, you know, we can go down the list. Or well-played Europe, you're finally going to invest in nuclear or, or at least back down a bit from that nuclear nonsense. You're actually going to invest in LNG infrastructure. You're going to invest in pipelines within Europe. You're going to finally do what you've avoided doing for two decades. Great. But boy, is it going to be expensive. So when you talk about expensive, what does that mean? Are we talking about larger deficits, which feels like that has to happen if they're going to do this? If they're going to commit to this, that 3% stuff is now total nonsense. That's right. It feels like that's a weaker euro as well. But I don't know, how are you thinking through? What does this mean when you say it's expensive? It's expensive because if people, if you take the politicians at face value, which I think on this one we probably should, they're all going to have to secure their stockpiles of gas and we could go down the commodity list and not forgetting fertilizers as well, which are kind of important. And that's going to underpin prices. Can I argue whether the Fed's behind the curve or not? But you would have thought one of, one of my prize was if the Fed's going to hit things hard as they are, credit would be falling apart like a bad meatloaf, Right. And there's been some widening in credit. There's been higher risk premium in credit. High yields been hit a bit, but it's all come back down. You have, of course, seen a very abrupt rise in 30-year fixed rate mortgages in the United States, which at some point will put a bit of a break on the ability of US households to refinance and put a bit of a crimp on consumption as intended. But mortgage-backed spreads have, not, have widened a little bit well, they've widened abruptly in some parts, but nothing compared to averages of the past decade plus. And it's just surprising that the Fed is so overtly hawkish and people are like, nah, doesn't matter. And I'm like, we must be so close to the point where this does matter. But it's in the price. It's in the price, but is it in the price of everything? Now, on the one hand, if the Fed's going to be really hawkish, and you're making a good point, if the Fed's going to be really hawkish, then you'd expect, I think, the dollar to be a lot stronger. You'd expect credit generically to be a lot wider. But on the other hand, if the Fed's hawkish because the underlying economy is solid, which, believe it or not, I think it still is, then credit may not widen too much because if the economy is on a solid footing, the cash flows will be there for all these borrowers to service their debt and in some cases refinance if they need to. But I'm just, but I'm thinking more of equities, okay? We've got to be close to the point, I imagine, where some really important companies say, look, I'm sorry to report this, but we are running into severe supply chain squeezes. And in order to ensure production and manufacturing is unaffected, we have had to pay up for inputs. And I'm sorry to tell you, that is going to reduce our profit margins. Thanks for coming. We always have inherent uncertainty when we're thinking about markets and investing, right? The inherent uncertainty is that, like the, um, the natural fog surrounding complex investment decisions, okay? But now on top of that, we have induced uncertainty, which is the man-made fog fabricated by denial and deception operations. And the masters of that are the Russians and the Chinese. And on top of trying to navigate what's really happening in global energy markets, what cargoes are doing what, who's financing what, what's the role of Gazprom Bank, how are the Germans going to secure energy supplies, all of that, are they finally going to build the Keystone Pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're all trying to understand scenarios or imagine scenarios for how one might resolve this Ukraine situation. But my problem is when I think about induced uncertainty on top of inherent uncertainty, which is always with us when we think about markets and investing, and you think about the man-made fog fabricated by denial and deception operations, 
I believe nearly nothing I'm reading about what's actually happening in Ukraine. I'm, I'm the same. I'm saying, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of filtering everything out because I'm just saying I don't know and I don't know what's true and what's not. I think that's wise. But then, so what? Let's think about what do we do? And of course, if there is some kind of near-term resolution or maybe a resolution full stop and you've got I now think of the US Strategic Petroleum Reserve role as the tactical petroleum reserve because they seem to uh, like to release it on a tactical basis. But, but you know, that ex bit of extra supply combined with some kind of resolution in Ukraine and you say, obviously, there will be relief via lower oil prices and lower gasoline prices and, and so forth. And that's, that's broadly a good thing. But then if you think about the structural, the KYS, know your supplier, commodities nationalism, national resilience, and the build out and capex required for the renewables transition, you say, you know what? I don't know exactly what the right price is now, but I need to have a plan to reinvest if and when the sell-off comes in what I imagine are the key trusted global commodity suppliers, their currencies, and their key businesses. I think we might get one more chance if we're lucky, simply because the capex required for this renewable transition is absolutely colossal. It's colossal. It feels that in that world, the Canadian dollar and the Aussie dollar do well, because they are the secure supplier. And... I'll just add quickly, um, we don't have time to go into it today, but there is a massive structural short in the Australian dollar. Aussie super funds, gigantic global investors within, or I'd say three, maybe five years, Australia will be one of the largest creditor nations in the world, which is astonishing when you think about how we used to view the Australian dollar and Australia's current account deficit and everything else, but it's true. And unsurprisingly, given the size of these gigantic Aussie super funds. Um, they have to put a lot of capital to work overseas because Australian domestic markets are just not big enough. And nearly all of that is unhedged. All of it. So that's why I'm starting to think, I know it sounds crazy, like should I be buying the Aussie versus the Remnimby? And on top of that, as of now, although there might be some last minute changes, as of now, there's regulation in Australia which will require all Australian super funds to report all their positions line item by line item, including the hedges. What? So there's a structural short position in the Australian dollar. If one Aussie super fund, just one, says, I want to fully hedge my currency exposure, it goes. It goes straight to 80 cents. And if two do it, right, it's served them well. Being unhedged short Aussie and investing to, in all sorts of global assets is like win-win. You've got the capital, capital appreciation on your dollars or euros or infrastructure, and you've got the currency going down. Happy days. But I'm just keeping in mind that there's a unique structural short in the Australian dollar. It does not mean anyone watching this should go out and start punting the Australian dollar, but they should start thinking about long-term structural winners. Eric Basmajan is a rising star macro analyst. And what's interesting, he falls more in line with my own thinking. Let's talk about your framework now, because okay. there is a huge amount of confusion and polarity going on uh, right now in, in where we are, if things have changed. Just talk us through right. your top big picture view. Okay, so going back to that secular view, I'm of the opinion that the long-term secular uh, decline in growth. And as crazy as it sounds, the long-term secular decline that we've had in inflation uh, is still very much intact because um, the two biggest factors are demographics, or if, if one factor would be demographics. And the demographics have continued to deteriorate. Nothing has changed with the demographics except they've gotten worse, right? We've had projections from 2019 and 2020 um, of where the demographics would be. And the last two years, not just the United States, everywhere, the demographics are coming in much worse than these expectations were, were forecasting. So there's going to be a continued drag 
from the demographic vector that's almost unquestionable. And then the, the debt load has obviously continued to balloon post COVID. So the, the secular force of debt and demographics, I think, is still very much intact. What, we, what we've had going on since the, the COVID rebound was an unbelievable cyclical rebound in both growth and inflation. And we can get into this, but I feel that the cyclical rebound was, of course, related to some of the stimulus that was sent out. But more so than the stimulus, there was a radical shift in behavior that I think was somewhat unrelated to the stimulus. It was more of a behavioral shift because of uh, COVID lockdowns. So as you know, Raul, from, from your business cycle work, that the two biggest portions of the, or the two biggest factors that drive the cyclicality of the cycle are housing and durable goods, right? Housing or manufacturing. And after COVID, we saw a unbelievable secular shift in housing, right? Everyone was leaving cities and moving to suburbs. That was a shift that was more of a behavioral aspect. I don't think anyone was moving from the cities to the suburbs because of a $1,200 stimulus check, right? That was, a, that was a behavioral shift because people no longer wanted to be in a closed space. Similarly, people had to uh, change their spending habits, not by uh, choice, mainly by necessity. You couldn't spend money at a restaurant, so you had to spend money uh, doing things at home. Right. So th those two factors, we had the largest, you know, I look at uh, housing and durable goods as a percentage of GDP. Right. Very cyclical indicator, very leading. We had the largest spike in housing and durable goods as a percentage of GDP almost ever. And that put in place an unbelievable cyclical force behind the economy. And that's what wrecks supply chains, some of which we're dealing with now. What's going to happen now and where the leading indicators are moving is that the housing is going to start to soften under the pressure of these rising mortgage rates that we're seeing. And the durable goods cycle is also starting to roll over. We're seeing indication that the manufacturing is starting to soften because prices have moved too high, real income is declining, and consumers are going to start stepping back from this uh, durable goods. And surge. inventories are super high as well now. Exactly, exactly. Uh, cost, um, Companies are going to find themselves with, with way too much inventory uh, as a result of this big pullback that consumers are going to have because their real income is declining. So wrapping all that together, we have this secular decline that's still in place. We're coming off the back of what was an unbelievable cyclical upturn. But now we're going to start to have a the, we're going to move down the backside of that cycle. Right. At the same time that the Federal Reserve is tightening and quite aggressively, might I add. So that's going to set up uh, what I think is a huge risk pocket in, in asset markets. I think that the internals of the equity market are saying this loud and clear. You look at things like uh, utilities relative to banks. Utilities are under, uh, outperforming banks, but rates are rising, right? That's an inconsistency. Uh, you look at something like housing stocks. Housing stocks have been getting absolutely hammered. And you say, well, of course, because mortgage rates are rising, but where housing goes, the rest of the cycle goes, right? So if housing stocks are going to get hammered under the pressure of rising mortgage rates, that's likely to feed through the rest of the economy. So I think that the internals of the equity market are very much picking on what's going to be, in my opinion, a very sharp cyclical slowdown. So what, what you're suggesting is that, okay, the yield curve has gone, well, it's negative in two to 10 swaps today and 13 basis points in, 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 uh, in the normal uh, bond yield curve and and five thirty spot has inverted today, I think as well. Yeah, so the market is telling us this, but nobody believes it yet. Right. Um, so the argument goes that there is a structural change in inflation due to deglobalization mm -hmm. and ongoing supply chain issues that that causes. Um. What's your view on that? Okay, so I don't believe that this is a structural shift in inflation. I think that this is a uh, long lasting cyclical change because if we have higher prices across various goods, right? But the, but the trend potential of the economy has not changed. So people's income is not necessarily changing because oil prices went to $150 a barrel. 
right? So what's going to happen and what we're seeing is all that's going to do is it's going to squeeze real incomes even harder. And, you know, whenever we look at the impact of these policies, specifically government policies, Raul, we need at least a three-year window to analyze the full effect, right? So the inflation really started to get out of control in March of 2021. That was the third stimulus check that kind of was was uh, overkill. And that's what blew everything out of proportion. We've only been in this for about a year now. Now, living through it for a year is quite a long time, but we haven't seen the backside of this policy yet. And what we're seeing now is we're starting to come down the backside of that policy, which is a collapse in real income, right? So real income is, is, is falling quite sharply. I have this chart of real personal income, X transfer payments, and we have a six or $700 billion gap in real income relative to the pre-COVID trend line. And what that's going to do is it's going to cause consumers to pull back really dramatically on the cyclical durable goods associated with housing and manufacturing. And that's going to re-exert that deflationary impulse that is generally seen on the economy when manufacturing slows globally. So I don't think it's a structural shift, Raul. I think that all that's happening is, is real income is going to collapse and that's going to cause consumers to pull back and you need to give it time for that backside of the cycle to play out before we can reassess whether this inflation is here forever or not. So if you're looking forwards using your framework, where do you see the range in bond deals? Does the chance of truth continue and we go even lower, which was my base case, but I'm starting to think that maybe they go sideways in, let's say, a 1% to 3% range mm -hmm. um, for an extended period. Most other people now, and everybody pretty much I've interviewed recently, all think it breaks higher. What it, what, how do you think this plays out? Right. So I think that if we look forward 12 to 18 months, I think that the, that, that chart of truth that you always point, I think it'll continue to prove true where that, that decline will, will still be in place. I don't think that bond yields break out to uh, to out of that channel and, and, and rise on a secular basis. Because as the yield curve is suggesting, as some of my forward-looking indicators are suggesting, we're going to have a continuation of this downturn in, in the growth rate cycle. And that's going to lead to what looks like to be recessionary conditions. And we know recessions kill inflation, right? So I, I do think that once um, – the cycle fully turns lower and recessionary conditions prove to be evident, we'll see those curve inversions deepen until the Fed is, is forced to, to pivot, uh, not because of higher inflation, but they're going to have an employment problem to deal with also, right? So when we look at growth versus inflation, when real growth declines and moves negative, Raul, then employment's at risk, even if inflation stays high. So the Fed does have a dual mandate that they have to deal with here. As, as far as does the, do we break to new secular lows, I do think eventually we will because these long-term structural forces um, are still very much in place. And I think that they're going to continue getting worse. And they're going to get worse because economic conditions on the ground continue to deteriorate. It's causing a, a, a larger downturn in the fertility rate. So I think all of these secular demographic forces are going to continue getting worse. Where we may move sideways is on the Federal Reserve's uh, decision on whether they adopt negative interest rates or not. Now, we're thinking way ahead here because we're, we're just starting this tightening cycle. But if, if um, what I think happens is going to happen, and I think maybe your framework as well, where we do start to see recessionary conditions emerge, uh, we're going to end up going back to the zero bound. And uh, I think that we're going to end up in a situation similar to Japan and Europe, where the long end pancakes on top of the front end. And then the, the, the Fed's going to have the decision of do we leave the curve invert, uh, flat at the zero bound or do we try and steepen it by dropping the front end negative? I think that's an open question. I think that the Federal Reserve has at the moment made a hard case against ever going to negative interest rates. So if they do hold the line on the front end, then there's going to be a limit to how far the, the long end can go. And we would end up then grinding sideways, I think. So if you're looking at this slowdown that I'm also picking up in my indicators, it's not clear outside of the yield curve. There's only a few things that have got recession kind of written all over them. So it's not consistent yet as far as I can see. But it feels to me that we're at the tipping point. 
where the inflation pressures start coming off and the year-on-year rate of change starts going down and mm-hmm. we start to see ISM slow down heading towards 50. And that right. looks like it's the next kind of three to four months we exactly. start seeing that. Exactly. What happens to the market? Because I think the market fundamentally has changed because of the reaction function from central banks. Mm-hmm. So historically, we had you know, a recession would lead to a 50% drawdown that lasted 18 months or so. But it right. feels like the currency de- debasement side of stimulus and monetary policy changes that. How are you, how are you thinking through all of that? Right. Others would say, well, the Fed aren't going to stimulate anytime soon. But I kind of think the market's forward looking. So I'm kind of arguing myself into circles here. But what do you think? <laughs> right? No, no, you're exactly right. And I, and I totally agree with you on your cyclical outlook that cycles coming down. There's a couple of things that look recessionary. Um, some things don't quite yet. I do think over the next two to three months, we could get there depending on how some of the things that you mentioned play out. We can go into that a little bit more. But as far as the market, the million dollar, trillion dollar question is the Fed's reaction function, right? Because we know the cycle is going to slow. The forward looking indicators are saying that with a pretty high degree of, of, of confidence. But is the Fed going to pivot, right? Are we going to have a December 2018 event? And is the Fed going to pivot? This time it's different, right? Because inflation's quite high. They say that they're not going to uh, pivot until inflation comes down. I think that we have a huge gap. And this is sort of what I like to present to clients as, as the value that I provide is these cyclical inflection points, right? And I think, as you mentioned, we are at one of these inflection points. Because what I see right now, Raul, is the bond market that's pricing in another eight hikes. The Federal Reserve is saying we're going to do another seven hikes, but the equity market is not saying eight hikes, right? So there's a huge disconnect between what's being priced into the bond market, what the Fed is saying they're going to do, and what the equity market is saying. And some of these uh, divergences you can pick up in some of the internals of the equity market. I mentioned uh, utilities to regional banks. Utilities are hitting 52-week high, outperforming banks. But rates are rising, right? You would think if rates are rising, you wouldn't want to be in utilities, you want to be in banks. So the equity market there is picking up the slowdown. You look at things like housing, you look at something like uh, even industrials to consumer staples, right? Industrials have been underperforming consumer staples. That's another growth slowing signal. So I do think that the equity market is picking up on this growth slowdown, but I don't think the Fed is going to pivot as quickly as they did the last few times. I think that they have a credibility issue that they have to uh, sort of rectify here. So I think that there's a huge delta going on between bond market pricing, Federal Reserve guidance, and equity market pricing. The divergences in the internals are suggesting that. And I think that that gap closes with a a drawdown to risk and a rally in rates. And what about growth? I've started getting bullish growth stocks because they're down you know, the race year end is down 70%. And generally, mm-hmm. these inflection points is when everyone's shaking their fist at the screen saying, I don't understand why this shit's rallying. Can't right. you see inflation? That I'm just that's, kind of thinking this yeah, is the that's time. That's another good point. You notice since the Fed meeting the last, you know, two weeks here or something, it's been it's been cues that have been outperforming again. And I think that is also, again, consistent with slowing growth, right? When, when the world as well, is, exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. I view crypto in very much the same lens as that, as sort of a risk on um, asset that benefits from the falling um, real rates, right? So real rates are rising uh, based on some of the um, uh, feeling that the Fed's going to tighten soon. But I think that the, the equity market is starting to pick up on that growth slowdown and the eventual decline. The other thing is, is, is gold, right? Gold is not being receptive to a to, Fed to that looks like it's <laughs> right. You know, if, if I told you that the Fed was going to hike eight times, I don't think that gold is normally the place that you would you would pick first. So there's a huge disconnect that I see between rates, market pricing and, and sort of all other assets. Uh, I think some of the assets are trying to front run. You know, the Fed is going to pivot. So I'm just you know, they're going to bid those assets up. But I think that we're going to be in here for a surprise, Raul. I think that the Fed ultimately will pivot. 
but I think that it's going to take longer than it normally has. And I think that that's going to result in these divergences closing. I think that that's negative risk. And do we see the internals change within that? So let's say the bulk of industrials and all of the kind of regular S&P stuff and the value stocks and the commodity stocks all all come down in this and growth outperforms again? Or does growth come down further again? What are you thinking? You think there's a whole another leg lower in this? So I think there's a I think that you have to split growth into into two buckets, right? You know, whenever I say growth stocks, um, some people think uh, Apple, Facebook, Google, you know, because those are heavy in a lot of these growth indexes. And that's generally what performs well in the growth slowing environments, right? The, the, the big mega cap technology. So I think those stocks do reassert their secular outperformance over the market. But also what's embedded in a lot of these growth stocks are the ARC type stocks. So I don't think those perform well. I think that those do fall under the weight of the economic cycle. So I think when you look at the the, the basket of growth, you want to be, you know, sort of the quality balance sheets, the big big caps, uh, you know, low net debt, things like that. But some of your more speculative growth, I think, will uh, continue to, to fall under the pressure of the cycle. Yeah, although, you know, I look at those and so many are down kind of, you know, look at something like Zoom. It's right. down, what, 85%? I'm like, sure, it can go down a bit more. But there's, right. a, there's right. a bunch of other stuff that that looks very different. How are you thinking through... I'm assuming you're thinking the same as me. This rise in commodity prices is basically a massive monetary tightening. That's exactly right. The, the, the commodities are doing the tightening of the Fed. So as you can see, this is a really complicated macro world. There's a lot of opinions, and these are really respected people. So what I wanted to do for you and for me is I wanted to go and speak to the people I really respect, some of the world's best thinkers, and find out how are they navigating this. So we spoke to, in the first week, starting on May 2nd, the best analysts in the world. We've got David Rosenberg to talk through the economic situation, Peter Zihan to talk about geopolitics, Juliette de Klerk to talk about the macro backdrop and markets, and there's many more coming. And starting on May 9th, the second week, We'll be talking to the world's best investors, how they're managing money in this environment. And again, I've got incredible guests that I've hand chosen. People like my friend Pierre Andoran, probably the world's most famous energy trader. Dwight Anderson, one of the world's most famous and successful commodity investors. So I want to find this out. I want to figure out what's going on. And I want you to come with me as I learn how to navigate this really complicated world. And let's figure out if a recession is coming and what does it mean? If you're not already a member, then join us at realvision.com forward slash global recession. And you can sign up for $1 and watch this incredible content.